Welcome to the podcast, Adam. How are you? Christian, how are you doing? It's good to finally get together. We, we've tried, haven't we, for a few weeks now, but it's good to finally get together. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Yeah, it's been a busy few weeks for me. Um, work, but obviously, um, I've recorded a few episodes as well. But yeah, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me. No, it's a pleasure. I've, I've enjoyed the, the first few I've listened to. Um, I don't know when this is going to go out. I might not be the next one, but um, what have I listened to so far? I listened to James, um, James Pillow. I, I, I know James through work from, from things I've done at Vesco um, and Jake Ramaldini, who, um, who we work very closely with at Codewild, who I work for. So yeah, I, I think it's brilliant. I think it's a great idea um, and I'm loving it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm subscribing, I'm listening and I'm on it, which is great. <laughs> um, we'll start at the beginning. Can you tell me how you got into the industry and where you're from? Um, so as you can probably tell from the accent, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm born and bred down in Somerset. Um, I, I live just south of Bath, which is handy because that's where Code Wild, who I work for, are based. Um, I've always lived in around the, the Bath area um, and I've never really moved away, really. Um, and, and part of my job with working all around the country, all around Europe and China and America has, has enabled me to travel. So it's kind of ticked the box. Um, how I got into it? I don't know, really. I guess like, in the 80s, late 80s and 90s growing up, I was always just sort of scallying around really and, and just getting in the non, sort of little bits of bother here and there and just doing what boys do, I guess, you know, making fires, climbing trees and finding old mopeds in the river and trying to get in the run and, and, you know, just doing stuff like that. Dad was always in the garage, changing the filters in cars and the exhausts were falling off and doing up old cars and stuff. So I was always sort of involved with with kind of engineering mechanics and and just sort of getting my hands dirty really um i was never that i was all right academically but it never it was never real i was never sort of textbook driven which is is strange because my sister is completely opposite she's four or five years older than me she's a consultant anesthetist and i can barely say it let alone understand what it is so she's always got her head in the textbook whereas i was the opposite so and i find that with my kids now they're completely opposite even though you bring them up the same so yeah, I was always kind of destined to get into engineering and, and welding because I was more hands-on than, than sat behind a textbook, really. And, and it, it kind of was the natural progression after school for me to get involved in it, yeah. Okay, so what did you do after school then? How did you get into it? Um, I couldn't wait to leave school. Um, and hopefully my kids don't listen to this because I hated every second of it. I like the playing the sports and the football and the, and the rugby and the athletics and things. And... I probably enjoyed myself a little bit too much at lunchtime with some of the girls and things like that, but I couldn't wait to leave. Um, and I always had like paper rounds and sticking up at the local pub playing skittles and um, working in sort of factories at weekends and summer holidays, shifting pallets around and just earning a bit of money. So as soon as the opportunity came after my GCSEs, um, I was straight out. I, I just couldn't wait to leave, which at the time, I well, in the past, I've regretted. Things have kind of worked out all right-ish since then. Um, but I left I left straight away at, at 16 um, and thought it'd be a good idea to go and get a job in a factory. So joined a factory and I was packing potato bags in the boxes with a hairnet on my head. And I was doing, I don't know whether it's even be allowed now, you know, I was doing night shifts, I was doing 12 hour shifts. All my mates were at school in the sixth form and things like that. And I'm in a factory with earplugs in, putting potato bags in the boxes thinking this could be me for the next sort of 50 60 years so um there was a an advert in the local paper to for an apprenticeship in mechanical engineering and welding um so i sort of went for it i went home and i on a bit i went home and dad said how's the job going knowing full well i must have hated it and i swallowed me pride and and bawled my eyes out and said dad i can't pack potato bags into a box for the rest of my life and he said well there's this advert apply for this and yeah that's how I got into the industry and I was very fortunate to pick up a four-year apprenticeship um, and that was that was the start of kind of a, a passionate love affair with all things engineering and, and welding wise yeah that was how it all started. Okay tell us a little bit about the apprenticeship then how you know how did that work? I was it was the first year they would ran the the new modern apprenticeship scheme I'm sort of giving away my age a little bit. I think I look a bit younger than I probably am, but I've got it's a probably not the modern camera. anymore, yeah. is it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, and, and there was a, a guy called Dave Wood, um, who's still a good friend, good friend now. Um, in fact, Dave's still at at the company that we did it. Um, he's, I think, he's now the the superintendent or something there. So he's gone right from apprentice to the to the head honcho. Um, 
but we were the first apprentices that they'd they'd taken on for 20, 30 years, you know, apprenticeship schemes had died. Um, so they treated us, these guys who were all probably 50, 60 plus, they treated us like they'd been treated back in the day for their apprenticeships to start off with. Um, and we spent a lot of times cleaning up, sharpening drills, um, grinding rake angles on lathe tools, um, in the weld shop, putting pads down, just running wires, changing liners, moving gas bottles, doing all the sort of the jobs as like a, they were treated. And at the time I can remember going to college and, and some of the guys were saying, well, we've been on CNC this, we've been, you know, we've been doing different process. We've been looking at sub arc. What have you been doing? I was saying, well, I'm not even, I haven't touched the welder. Yeah. You know, I'm making the tea. I'm getting, I'm getting literally hit and beaten. I'm, I'm sweeping up and things like that. But I don't, I think that was brilliant because it gave me a real grounding and respect that when we were allowed to actually get in, um, into the weld shop or into the machine shop and actually start making stuff, we had that inbuilt respect about keeping things clean, looking after your tools. We had to make all our own kit and it's such an old school apprenticeship that we made all our own tools. We made a little um, bench voices, little plumb bobs, parallel bars. We had everything all set up and we had it all there ourselves. And we'd add our little toolboxes full of all of our tips, all of our shrouds, all of our ceramics, our tungstens were sharpened right. So we had everything there for us and it was a good grinding in, in terms of we couldn't wait to get going on the real side of things, but we had to do that first. And the first year of the apprenticeship was hard. I didn't really enjoy it. I thought this isn't for me, but that grinding has, has kept me going now. You know, whenever I go on a job now, I go on site, it's all about keeping it clean, getting the housekeeping in order, doing the basics first and just keeping your mouth shut and getting your head down and then grafting. Um, and that's a big secret, I think, for anyone to succeed in any any form of engineering or any welding. Just get in somewhere. The first time you go to a site, if you're the first time you meet the boys for the first time, just keep your mouth shut, get your head down, keep it clean, tidy, do your work, and, and yeah, and you'll, you'll sort of get on all right. Yeah, look, obviously apprenticeships are very difficult to start with. I can remember earning like £80 a week working down in Cardiff was probably putting £40 a week in my car, you know, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. as you said, you know, especially when you're first trying to learn to weld and you're not doing very well, go and cut yeah. another piece, cut another piece. But obviously you eventually then something clicked yeah. and, you know, people spend some time with you and, you know, the, the technical side of things eventually clicks. Um, yeah. So I mean, what, I, what type of welding were you doing? We were doing, we were doing all sorts. We were doing TIG, stick, MIG, and it was, I mean, the college, they, they weren't the best at the college, to be honest. It was kind of X, ex welders who sort of given up a little bit and it was getting the bay boys there's a lump of material put a pad down in one direction put a pad down in the other direction and you'd end up building up these huge overlay pads um and then they cut it open they said well, there's a void there do it again and that was kind of it to start off with um and it was mainly on carbon steels because that's all the, the college could afford to do so you learned the basics but you didn't really get too far with it in the second year we we sort of moved into fillet welds building up multi-run fillets part pen butts, back out and seal butts. And then eventually we then started doing TIG welding on very thin, you know, sort of dairy wool stainless pipe. And that took us to kind of the end of it. And it ticked the box in terms of, in terms of what they needed to do at the college. Um, so we didn't do too much at college, which is a bit of a shame really, because we were there to actually learn to weld, but we were learning more about welding at work with the boys that we were copying at work. and. It was the first apprenticeship scheme, so it got us out of work for the day, but it's more of a DOS really. You know, we used to, we used to get given the afternoon and we'd make barbecues. And they say, What are you doing? And eBay was just kind of kicking off. So we 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 were selling barbecues, we were getting all yeah. the drums, cutting in half, putting the feet on them, and we were shipping them out. We had all the rack in there, we were tick welding all the mesh up for the top of the barbecues. So yeah, we um it was a good crack at college, but we probably didn't learn quite as much as we should have done at the time. Yeah, look, I think college was kind of the same same for our age as well. But we used to have such good fun times there, you know, yeah. with kind of messing around and joking yeah. around. But obviously, then we were actually gaining our qualifications as well, which you don't really realize at the time. But no. the knowledge you pick up through, you know, you might not be thinking about it, but you know that sort of sets you for the rest of your career because the things they teach you obviously come in handy. Um, yeah, I think I think probably looking back and even just talking talking about it now, you know, this is. 20 years ago and more I was doing it, but I probably learned more than I realized. Um, yeah. You know, I, I burnt myself more than I, I can't remember, but you learn 
and it's not the way to teach people, but you're always burning yourself. You know how heavy things are. And you see some people now and they're so green, the noises and sounds and smells and temperatures and, and grind and everything about it. It was just that initial familiarization with what it's like to be in around the welding workshop, what it's like to actually be melting metal. And I can remember, do you remember when you started to learn to drive? You know, you, you're there and you're, you're driving and you've got to indicate and look in the mirror at the same time and you're thinking, I can't, I can't do this, I can't. And then something clicks and then after the experience, you're driving down with a coffee in one hand, your mobile on the other. Well, not that I do that, just in case anyone's listening. But do you know what I mean? You're listening to the radio, you're chatting to your mate, you're waving the sunlight at the window. Welding for me was a bit like that. And especially with MIG welding, MAG welding, sorry, Jake Ramadini go mad if I call it MIG welding. Um, you know, especially with sort of MAG welding that I never felt in control of the arc. I'm always chasing it. I'm, I never knew what it was doing. It was always in control of me until the penny dropped. And that's just time on the arc, time on the torch. And, I, and then when it dropped, I thought, I'm in control of it. I, know, I can actually put this where I'm going now. I understand. And that was probably, you know, all those hours you spend in the first couple of years at college, messing around with your wire feed, messing around with your voltage, seeing what it does, see if you can blow a hole in a 10 mil plate with your second run and thing, just doing everything you're doing. You're learning probably more than you actually realize. So I've probably done it an injustice there. I probably did learn more than I actually realized yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not to be to fair, you, you normally have one of the boys in college turn your set all the way up and then as <laughs> soon as you strike yeah. up, you blow a, blow a hole in something or blow a hole in the bench and you're like... Swap your tumps tonight for a bit of wire and all this sort of stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sort of when you when you briefly said about that, I remember somebody telling me um um he was watching me stick weld and he said, You're actually just I was kind of just ragging the rod. He said, You know how you don't have any control over where yeah. you put in metal. He said, once you actually start deciding where you put it, that's when you're gonna learn how to weld properly. And then it yeah. kind of it as you said, it kind of just clicked with me then because I yeah. was always afraid not afraid of it, but I just kind of be hold it, drag. And then once I actually started putting the metal where I wanted to, it just kind of got a lot easier then. It all slows down, doesn't it? I can remember it, it does, because you're more familiar with it. It seems like it's not a rush. You're in control. Yeah. You have got a few, and it's the same time. It's exactly the same time you strike a rod and, and you are in control and you realize you can start manipulating the arc a little bit and you can actually breathe. I used to hold my breath. Did you ever do that? You're like, <gasps> oh, here we go. And no. and you just <laughs> relax yourself and things like that. And as I'm explaining it, it's all kind of coming back a little bit of, of what it used to be like in those early days. But no, it was, it was, it was good. And then that obviously gave us the confidence and, and worked the confidence that, that we've, we've got our sort of city and guilds and um, MVQ level twos, whatever it was, just to get in and start actually welding and start fapping up and things at work, which is good. Okay, so what, what happened for you after college then once you finished, completed your time? So I did, it was a four year apprenticeship and this, I, I smashed my hand up playing football. It was, it was that bone there. I know it's a podcast and people can't see, but I, I smashed my hand up playing football. Um, and so I was off because I couldn't get to work. I was all in plaster and I was, I was signed off and I was fortunate enough to get full sick pay. Um, and I was off for about three months. It was a really bad break. And every time it grew back, I had to have it rebroken and things like that. And during that time, some of the guys I played football with worked for a company called Coda World. And I was bored. You know, I, was, I, was, yeah, I had my own first little flat. I was living in my flat. Um, and I just popped in and seen them when they said, you'll have to come in. We're, we're a little engineering company. There's like nine, 10 people that worked for Coda World at the time. I sort of guessed it was welding. I didn't really know, you know, what they did. Didn't understand Coda World. I didn't know what it was. Um, so I walked in and I've, I've seen a machine shop and I said, well, we've got a machine shop at work, you know, oh, we've got welding bays. I do a bit of welding. And it turned out that everything they did was what I'd been doing for the previous four years. Um, so I sort of went in there for a cup of tea and I, I pop in there and see them a little bit. And on my first day back after being off sick, I, I basically handed me notice in and, and joined, joined Coda while so I, I took the sick pay, which is, I was young and naive, you know, I would never dream of doing it now, but um, yeah, I joined Code World straight away then. So, and I've been there ever since. So, I'll have been there twenty years in December. Then. Okay. Yeah. So, what was your role when you first went into Code World? Like a welder fabricator, or? Well, Code World was a very different company to what it is now. Um, I joined in December two thousand and four, and at the time, the company had three very different sections. There was welder training. Um, they had a fabrication shop where they actually get outside outside work in. Then they had the laboratory and then they had a little bit of NDT and the NDT would support the laboratory works, but it would also support the stuff that they were fabbing up. You know, we used to do factory shutdowns. So we'd, we'd go out off and, and do 
big um, big autoclave sort of brick ovens in in factories where they're baking bricks and it would be our job as code well to go in and the shut down clean it all out any pitting and corrosion we'd just be padding all of that up some of the rails would need replacing so some of the bracketry would go in and you'd go in on the shutdown 24 hours sort of shifts day and night and we'd go in there and, and clean them all up um, and then the ndt company would, department would come in afterwards and sort that out so yeah a little bit of that and then through the window there's this nice clean area like which is a workshop and i think well that's a bit cleaner than this i like this and i had a bit of a machine experience tagged on my apprenticeship and at the time the guys in the workshop you know they were they were machinists but they were sort of welders as well so speeds and feeds and things like that so being the cocky little so-and-so that i was i've sort of gone in there and started doing a little bit of machining and then through the next window there's an even cleaner place called the laboratory where they're pulling tensiles bend testing impacts macros hardnesses i think well that looks even better still let's go and have a little look at that so i sort of floated for a, for a little bit and found myself in the laboratory um and as luck should have it the the guy who, who taught me so much he was he was ex rolls royce he was the quality manager lab manager a guy called mike anthony fantastic he's, he's still he's still alive um but yeah. you know Mike, mike's probably in his 80s now um and he did so much for code one and me personally in terms of what he taught me from through metallurgy point of view um he kind of took me under his wing a little bit which was fantastic um and taught me about how to work in a in a ucas accredited laboratory how to how to literally perform all of the mechanical tests that we, that we still do now so I sort of distanced myself a little bit from, from the welding side of things. Um, and then very quickly, because of the accreditation that Code Wild's got, we had to shut the welder training because there's a huge conflict of interest um, when we got a, a recognized third party organization accreditation. And so that side of the business shut down. So it was a good job I jumped ship beforehand because the, the welding and fabrication side actually shut down. And we became the, the sort of that was the, the start of the company that we've become today where we've got our our testing laboratory and then the on-site witnessing of world equals procedures and the ndt so yeah that sort of took me away from that and that's that's where my real journey with code wild started really okay yeah so what is your current role with code wild now at the moment um I've basically done every job in the building. You can imagine in 20 <laughs> years, you know, as I've, I've tried everything. I'm not very good at all. So I just get moved on to the next stage. But so I, at the moment, um, together with Clive Slocum, um, I'm one of the two senior senior managers at the company and we kind of oversee it all. Um, I'm, I'm still the head of department, uh, the technical manager for the surveillance department. Um, but I think the guys sort of look after me rather than I look after them. So. Yeah, I've, I've done a lot. So we'll take it back a stage that from being sort of workshop technician to a lab technician, um, I then, Mike Anthony, the guy I was just telling you about, he retired um, and I got the laboratory manager's job um, assisted with with Clive. He was, he was sort of in the lab at the time as well. So I started running the laboratory. I did that for a few years um, and then became a welding inspector surveyor. So started going out witnessing the quals and procedures. And as we grew from two inspectors to three to four to five and things like that, um, a role came up um, from, from Alan Millington, who, who founded the company. He unfortunately passed away and a role came up as head of inspection. Um, it was the right place, right time again. So I, I got that. And, and since then we've grown the department to the, the size it is now. Um, and then, yeah, we, it sort of moves up David who who owns the company. Um, he part owns the company with the, the Fenner group now. Um, he sort of asked Clive and myself to step in and, and run the company on a day to day basis. Um, so that's what we do. Yeah. So probably a little bit of everything. You know, you might find me painting yeah. a car park in one minute and then doing a sales meeting the next invoice the next and then witnessing some world calls the next. So a little bit of everything. But yeah, I'm, I'm more involved with the, the witnessing and surveillance side of things from a day to day basis. Yeah. Okay, then. So for anyone who would like to get into inspection, what sort of quals did you have to do then for the inspection? I think for me, the, a really important thing is getting the basics understood. You know, you, you could take anyone, you could, you could be a painting inspector and know nothing about welding. And if, you've, if you're academically switched on, you could go on a week's course and get a 3.1. For me, that doesn't make you an inspector. It will give you the qualification but the piece of paper doesn't make the person. So it's very easy to get 
to hide behind the qualifications, you know, should we get your MPI ticket first, get visual MPI, DPI, that'll get you involved with looking at welds and the integrity that you've got. Then you can move into PCN level two, weld inspection or C-SWIP, three, three, one, three, two. For me, it's about hours on site. It's about experience. It's about understanding processes, understanding defects, having a little bit of understanding of non-destructive testing, mechanical testing, different materials, different processes. Because once you've been there and done it, I'm not saying you have to have been a welder for five, 10, 15 years, but until you've got that experience of different materials and processes and what the welders could do wrong, because you've done it wrong yourself, um, you're a better inspector for it as well. So the best qualification really would be experience for me. Um, and I know that's hard for people trying to get into it, but you know, you're already on the way to being an inspector even if you're just starting at what you may deem as the bottom, these are the really important bits. So if you've been welding for a couple of years and your goal is to become an NDT inspector or a, a running sort of 3.1 jobs and things like that, just pay attention to what you're currently doing because you will come back and rely on those scenarios and, and those experiences you've had as a welder to get you there. Um, and yeah, then, then go on a course and, and you'll, you'll breeze through your 3.0 and your 3.1 and, and your 3.2s because you've been there and done it. And that's what the courses are there. Yes, you'll learn, you'll learn a hell of a lot and they're by no means easy, but the experiences that you've had will, will stand you in great stead for that, definitely. Exactly. I think it, sort of every welder is his own inspector to start with. So if you have that base of, of knowing what's acceptable and, and not acceptable, then it's definitely a good start, isn't it? That, obviously, that's not to say you have to be a welder, but just to have, have been around the industry and have experience, obviously, it helps yeah. a lot, doesn't it? I mean, you'll know, you'll know yourself as, as soon as you finish a weld, the first thing you do is look at it. Yeah. Um, so you're performing visual inspection. It might not be the 17637. You might not have the right lux there and the right angles and things like that. But you're performing a visual as soon as you do it. From the first weld you ever put down, you're already on the way to becoming a visual inspector. So it, it just takes that little bit more interest to take it to the next level. Can you grab a, a weld gauge out? You might not know how to use it, but at least just trying to size it. Can you start looking at throats and legs and what are those holes called? Next thing you know, you're classing it as porosity and you're looking at fault finding for it. And then you grab a copy of 5817. And next thing you know, you know what you're doing. You know, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. you're either doing that or you're hiding the weld. One of the other two, <laughs> <laughs> hiding under the bench somewhere. <laughs> or you're still behind a grinder all day long. <laughs> but yeah, no, look, definitely. Um, so did you sort of go into any other education and sort of any higher education through your time at Coda Weld? Um, I mean, since I've been at Code World, there's been, it's, a, it's a, the company will support anyone to do whatever they want to do. You know, they really will. And if, to go on and get a welding engineer and, and push you right through, we've got people now and we speak to them all the time. If that's what they want to do, they can do it. And the company's never, they, they've always sort of tried to persuade me to do it at the time. Um, but I've been so focused on developing the company and developing myself in that role. I've never gone down that stage, um, down that route, sorry. I've never, whether I will in the future, I don't know. I'm getting more involved with the commercial side of the company now and building the company up. So the sort of qualifications I'll be looking to, and I'm, I'm sort of empowerment of people and looking after the staff and motivating staff and working on the mental side of the business um, and people's attitudes and how you work for, the, work for each other and things like that. That's where I see my next qualifications coming in the right. people. Um, rather than probably focus towards the welding side of things, to be honest, um, you know, 20 years in now, years, years 20 to 30, I think it'd be more based on, on the, the sort of mental side of the, of people, their attitudes, how you work with people, how you get the best out of people, what makes a good inspector, um, and that along with the educational side of things as well, which is what I'm doing a hell of a lot of as well at the moment, a hell of a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's difficult to know what direction to go in, isn't it? Because. I've kind of gone down the inspection route at the moment. Um, I've gone back to do a HNC uh, part-time yeah. through distance learning. And probably I'd say the welding engineer route is something I will probably go down over the next couple of years. Obviously, just finding the right place to do that with the right support. So obviously, it's great yeah. that Coda Weld help people with that because companies need to push people forward because that's how we're going to grow and improve, isn't it? Definitely. Um, I mean, the guys that come with us, so... One of our inspectors at the moment, Reese Provis, has been with us for 
probably three years now. I first met Reese when he was apprentice welder, uh, a company in Bristol, Jordan Manufacturing. Unfortunately, they're no, no longer around. Um, and I met Reese on literally day one. And I can remember, and I always, I still rib him now about it. He was, he was welding. He was like, oh, I can't weld with this thing on my head. I, how do people do this all day long? It's making me neck ache. And he was whinging. And I can remember, I said, mate, you've got a long, long time ahead of you. You know, 16, 18 years old, whatever he was, whinging about wearing a weld and did. And I go, you've got a long time ahead of you. Um, he now works for us. He's now, he, he's spent a couple of years with us. He's now done his 3 1. He's, he's going to push on and things like that. And it's, it's the progression of that, it's getting people into the industry and keeping the education going because it keeps you fresh as well. It stops you plodding along. And as long as you can give everyone that path, you know, that where's your route going? What are you going to be doing next year, the year after, the year after? And if the answer is, I'll probably be doing the same job every single day. Some people are fine with that. That's, that's good. But if more often than not, people that we work with, they've got that little plan. Well, I want to do this for a couple more years, and then maybe I'd like to start training other people to do it. Maybe I'd like to start running seminars at colleges. Maybe I'd like to do something else like that. So, yeah, we, we, we try and support people that in their own personal development, just because it buys them into the company, you know, and we buy into them. So it's, it's kind of a two-way thing, yeah. Yeah, no, look, that's great, and, and that's exactly how it should be. Um so obviously you, you spoke a little bit about sort of being more interested in people. Um, obviously you briefly told me about, said you would like to speak about mental health and that side of things. Is that something you're passionate about? It is. Yeah. Um, just from my own sort of my own experiences really over the last sort of three or four years, you can get so tied up with work. You can get so tied up with everything being so important always satisfying the customer, always satisfying everyone you work with. And it's, it's, it's so stereotypical and you'll know what I'm going to say, but especially as blokes, we just don't, we just put on an act really that we're all right. We're all right. And something eventually has got to give. And we've done some crazy things to, to build the company and, and and our guys still do a lot now, but you know, you can't be working 60, 70, 80 hours every week, year on year on year our families, our friends still go out and have a few beers, then get into bed late and then worry about doing this without something going pop. Um, and it, I got to the stage where my anxiety was so bad. You know, I was going to speak in, in front of 30, 40 people or, or sit in committees. And I was doing it. And I'm literally physically, physically sick before I'm doing it. I thought, this can't be right. You know, this is a bit more than just being nervous and excited. And I was, I was suffering massively with anxiety. Um, so you just sort of, I, I chatted to someone, I, I rung someone up, chatted to them, and it was sort of perfectly normal. And as soon as I had that first conversation, and then I, I said to a few boys like at work and people that have nothing to do with welding, um, I spoke to them in the pub and I said, oh, I'm struggling a bit, mate. And they said, I'm the same. You know, one of my mates a joiner. I said, he said, I'm the same, mate. And it's amazing how many people you speak to about it. So now I'm really open about it. And I tell anyone that, look, if, if I can go and do it, you know, when I speak in a room full of 50 people I've never met about welding, um, and I can still do that now. It's all right to feel a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious about things, a little bit low in mood, a little bit down. So yeah, it's really important now. And I know everyone's jumping on. It's like, like everyone's jumping on the mental health bandwagon. I don't mind that. The more people that do it, the better. Because if you broke your leg, it's a real cliche. You break your leg, you get it sorted, but you break your head and you just sort of pretend and your missus or your mates to say, I was working. You go, yeah, it's all right. And deep down, you're, you're dreading it and you're really down with it. So yeah, it's really important to speak about that sort of stuff. And it's certainly nothing to be embarrassed about. I think the problem is probably the age we are as well, because if you go back to maybe 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't something that was spoken about. So obviously myself, I would say definitely wouldn't always speak about things, would let things build up. And as you said, is everything all right? Yeah, everything's yeah. fine. And it's not. And then a lot of the time, you know, instead of talking about it, I just go down a pub and have a few pints or yeah, you exactly. know, like you get rid of it that way. And then yeah. you wake up the next day, hang over for work. And as you said, anxious and, you know, yeah, that yeah. doesn't help anything. It's only sort of speak and you don't have to go and see someone and speak you can just speak to your mates you know you can exactly have a right. chat because you know the amount of young young people who take their lives yeah you know it and and that's not you know not people jumping on the bandwagon we just have to be yeah. you know we have to speak about it i think the sort of age as you get to sort of mid 30s and you know people start a certain a certain lot in, in my sort of scenario you've gone from playing football or rugby with your mates all the time going out in the week 
having a good few beers, getting up, cracking on with work, getting the overtime in the weekends, playing football the weekends, back out again on it, going to watch football here, going doing this, doing bang, 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 bang. And all of a sudden you think, oh, I've got a couple of kids now. I'm not going out. I'm not 21 anymore. Life's slowing down. Am I, am I, have I got, where's all my friends gone? What's, and you just have a bit of a sort of, it's not a midlife crisis, but you just have a reality check that things are slowing down. And, you know, when I started speaking with some of my closest friends from all different, one's a cardiologist, one works for a local housing company, one's a chippy, you know, for, one's a printer in a factory. I started speaking to all these guys. Yeah, I was a bit like that, mate. I was really, really low, really, really down. I went to speak to someone about it and, you know, sort yourself out. Some like I did a bit of meditation, mate, off Spotify and things like that. So you, it's all, too, you can get really, really involved with work so much. And there's little signs there that you pick up on. And that person is always stressed, always snappy always a little bit late, always tired and things like that. And just say to them, are you all right, mate? Are you all right? And it's, there's people I've spoken to and they've got, thanks, Adam. You know, I appreciate that, mate. That does mean at the end of the day, instead of just going home, say, all right, mate, what are you up to tonight? What are you up to? What are you doing? Work, it's not a concentration camp when you go to work. You know, we work as, I work my nuts off as hard as anyone does, you know, and that's the only way you achieve anything. But at the same time, you've got to take a reality check sometimes and realize if you're going to work till what are we going to work tonight, mate? What are we going to be 65, 68, 70, probably? 68, by the time? I yeah. Think so. yeah. <laughs> so if we've got to work that far, you've got to try and do it with a smile on your face and you've got to look after the blokes around you as well, you know, because what would happen if the, the guy that you've been sat next to in a chair ever did anything just because you couldn't be bothered to just say to him, Are you all right, buddy? You're a bit, a bit uptight at the moment. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, something I'm really, really passionate about. And I've, I've just written a little a little book, which you can get on Amazon and stuff like that now, about journaling, about gratitude. I know it's supposed to be a welding podcast, not a bloody mental health thing, but, you know, it is. Look, it's obviously very <laughs> important and, you know, more than happy to speak about it. Yeah, it's just about what you're grateful for. I think, well, nothing, nothing at all. I've got to get up and go to work again. And I love my job, you know, I've, I've been there 20 years. I love it more than anyone, but you can be grateful for so many little things, you know, just wake up in a warm house, having a bit of breakfast, getting in a car and driving to work, not hitting any traffic. There's, there's so much stuff to look for. So, so yeah, it's, it's something I, I'm really quite sort of passionate about now. Yeah. And, and when I go out doing my little seminars and things like that, at year one colleges and stuff like that of apprenticeships and stuff and, and things linked to skill world, which is a competition we support, which I know Jake Rambodini was talking to you about again on my little safety moment at the start, it used to be about the dangers of argon and fumes. I've taken that out now because they all kind of know that anyway. Now I harp on about this for a little minute. And if, you know, if it, if it helps one person, brilliant, you know, happy days. Yeah, look, um, I'll, if you send me the link, I'll chuck it in the bio underneath. So if there's anybody watching or listening and, and they'd like to have a look, then obviously that is there. Yeah, fantastic. No, I appreciate it. That's good. It's great. Okay, Adam, another thing I've been asking my guests, can you tell me a funny story from the industry? Something that comes to the top of your mind? Oh, a funny story. What have I done? There's been a lot of funny stories because when you're on site, it is a good oh, crack. God, isn't it? Yeah, it is it a is. great crack. I've been doing a lot of work down Hinkley and there's some great guys down there. And we, yeah, we, again, we work hard and you work long shifts, but that's one thing that keeps me going in the job because the blokes are just brilliant. And you know, I mean, as, as an inspector, you get a bad name as an inspector, don't you? Because you're the inspector. Well, you can still call a bad well, but you can still get a repair done and do it the right way. So yeah, we we have a good crack. I mean, one thing that I I'll say it about myself, so I don't get anyone in trouble. When I first joined Codewell, so I'm not talking like first few weeks. Um, company I used to work with used to have these big polycarbonate screens, you know, not not perspex polycarbonate, so impact resistance. And the thing we used to do at, at work in the previous company is you go up there with a hide hand hammer and give it a big whack, and it would make a big sound. And if you if you're machining, if you're doing something, you jump them up. So I've joined Code World, and in between the laboratory and the workshop, they had this huge polycarbonate window. And Nigel, the machinist, was the other side of the window. So I thought this would be great. I'll make friends with Nigel. I'll have a bit of a crap with him. I'll make him laugh. So I picked up a hammer, hit the polycarbonate as hard as I could, only to discover it wasn't polycarbonate at all. It was a single sheet of glass, and the whole thing shattered. And I'm stood there with a the hammer in my hand. Now he's just covered in glass the other side of it. And Alan, the, the, one of the, the owner at the time, he came back and he said, what the hell has happened there? I said, it smashed. And I'm still stood in the same position with a hammer. And he said, what the bloody hell did you think it was going to do? <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, that's kind of me all over, you know, that is, I just thought, what an idiot. Why have I done that? But 
oh no there's there's so many things that you all have like the stories you get things that oh, get yeah, on site and the the ribbon i got done once i was on a on a shutdown in uh, in Fellside, just outside of Sellafield, and i was having a, a go with a, a brilliant welder brian he's, he's a great lad i'm still in touch with now he's from middlesbrough great guy um and I, I called a load of welds, it was all good. And we've been having a bit of a chat about preheats and cooling down periods. And he was saying, come on, this is a job and not, let's get going. I said, no, no, we've got to do this. You've got to get the heat into it, blah, blah, blah. Well, long story short, he'd taken a pencil and he'd drawn the center line crack all the way down through it. And this, it's all done, it's all signed off. And he's, he shouted out, Adam, you've got to come up here and have a look at this, mate. Dead pan, serious. And what's going on? He went, no, seriously, get up here. So well, what the hell's happened now? So I've gone up here and he said, it's all cracked, mate. And I looked at it. I said, he said, you didn't, what's been the, um, the preheat on this? Did you, I said, right, mate, don't you start, mate. I've been on about this for the last three days. We've done all this right. You know, we have, he went, I'm not putting my name to any of this, mate. This is all you, you're the inspector on this. And I've gone, well, I can't, I won't repeat what I've said. I'm like, you are kidding me. And I've gone up to it. And the obvious first thing to do when like you see your crack, you just, you sort of touch it. And as I touched yeah. it, it rubbed away. And then I rubbed it all away and, and he's gone. Like he's, he's off down the scaffolding and I'm chasing him, shouting every name under the sun. But yeah, he oh. did me like a kipper then. He actually did me like a kipper, yeah. Brilliant, isn't it? I kind of, when you, when you were speaking about the first story, it reminded me when we were apprentices <laughs> and there was this there was this one guy, a plater. I don't actually remember his name, but he was an ex-powerlifter, very big guy and he used <laughs> to walk around with his earmuffs on and um, cotton wool in his ears. Well. Yeah. One of the lads thought I was in the toilet. So what we were doing at the time was chucking sort of water over the top of the toilet and soaking <laughs> each other. And I was there welding and he ran out and he said, shit, I've accidentally chucked water over uh, so and so. I can't remember what his name. And next thing, he almost kicked the door off the hinges and he said, I'm going to kill whoever that is. And they, they had yeah, to kind of much. take him into the office and cool him down because he was like, one of those apprentices, I'm going to strangle him. And we were kind of hiding under our lids, Amazing, pretending yeah. to weld. but. Uh, yeah, it's yeah brilliant. Fun, such fun times you know especially, yeah you uh, do yeah it's so it's so important being out on site it's it's always a crack you're there at, i mean down at hinkley point at the moment which is an amazing project to be involved in one i've been desperate to go even before it even started building um and to be down there doing the things we're doing with with the tunnels and and everything we're doing is it's an amazing project but you know you're still getting a site at 20 to 6 in the morning having got out of bed at four o'clock in the morning and you're all tired and you're all sort of you've got all your high vis on it's a bit damp or it might be a bit wet and you're all waiting to go where and someone will just say something it'll be a little dead panel or someone will come in and just whack your hair hat off and it skids across the floor and and you turn around and you say yeah thanks mate you, you plonker and the rest of the boys though they're killing themselves because someone's just knocked your hat off and it's little banter like that just little things that go on all day every day non-stop that sort of keep you going through the, the 12, 14 hour shifts and it? it's, it's good. Yeah, the thing is, look, you spend so much time with the lads, you become really close, you know, and, yeah, you and you you have that banter and you have a laugh. And, you know, if you're in sort of good environments where it's fun and it, it's, it doesn't seem so bad, then it's yeah. kind of, if you're in somewhere where there's a toxic environment, that's kind of when the days drag and, yeah. you know, you can't wait to leave then, isn't it? Yeah, it's really important to build that relationship up, especially from an inspector side of things as well. You know, it's very easy at the start of a project as an inspector to be cast aside. And people would just say, make sure when you get on the job day one, they know who's boss, you're the inspector, they do. Well, that's a load of rubbish, to be honest. You're there to do your job. And if you do your job and they do their job right, you've got, there's a mutual respect for you all and you can still have a crack with them. You can still, you can still get into it, you know. And if you get off on the wrong foot on a little project, you know, we do a lot of 3.1 projects that will go on for for a month or six weeks and things like that. That can be a very lonely, long six weeks as an inspector. Um, but if you get in with the guys, you know, and, and they'll work with you, you know, they'll start adhering the preheats to, to heat inputs. They, they'll be, Adam, I'm changing me rods, mate, do you want to come and sign this? They'll work with you because they respect you. And, and they, won't, they won't expect you to turn a blind eye to anything because they know that you're there to just do your job, you know? So building your relationship as an inspector, if I was going to give any advice to anyone, what I'd be, Build a relationship with the folks you're working with. Let them know you're a human being and not a welding inspector. And, and they'll respect you as, as well. And they'll sort of help you out in your job. To the end of the day, they'll be going, and this happened the other day. We needed a, a seven mil throat on it. The welder's got his own little weld gauge. He's got it off of Alibaba.com. And it's, it's not, and he's, he's using it. He goes, oh, I don't think this is big enough, mate. I don't think this is even big enough. I'm going to, 
I said, do you want me to come and have a look at it, Charlie? It's Charlie, his name is. He's a great, great guy. I said, do you want me to come and have a look at it, Char? Are you just going to tell me it's not big enough and you're going to put some more? Yeah, don't even bother, mate. I'm just going to build it up. I know it's not big enough. So they're always doing your job for you. you know, they're doing their own inspection because they respect you enough that you know they're not going to try and pull the wool over your eyes and hide anything. So yeah, it's um, it's good to it's good to get that relationship with the guys, and it is a good crack sometimes as well. Yeah, look, I think it's just obviously, as you said, doing things right and doing things correctly, but also having a little bit of common sense as well. You know, you don't have to be there standing like I've had inspectors there standing yeah. over my shoulder. What? Yeah. I would never do that. I would always have oh, enough respect to let the welder get on with his job, and obviously then at the end come in to sign her off. Or, you know, yeah. obviously within reason. You know, but it's nothing worse than having someone standing there staring at you, is it? Definitely not. And it's such a small industry. Everyone will say this. I know it's called the game is gone and all the older guys say, oh, it's gone, mate, it's gone. But the only other thing you hear all the time is, oh, it's a small world, the world industry. Everyone knows everyone. And, and it's so true. And, you know, I'd rather be known as someone that, oh, Adam, he always does it right. And so, and so you say, well, what's wrong with that? You know, it's rather than go, oh, you want to get him. He, he just stays in the cabin all day. He'll sign anything off. You know, I, I, me personally, I'd rather have my own integrity. I know I can walk onto any site I go onto and, and you generally bump into a welder somewhere or an inspector or a, or a plant manager you've seen somewhere and they go, hello, Adam, right, yeah. And they know exactly what they're getting. They might not like it, but they know exactly what they're getting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Look, that's all you can do is go in and do your best. As you said, such a small world, you know, we were briefly chatting earlier. We know so many of the same yeah. people, even though we've never met each other. But, you know, that's <laughs> just small industry, you know, all working on similar jobs, same places. And you know the good guys and you know the you know the ones that aren't so good as well you know you don't even need to mention any names because anyone listening to this will already have a picture of some of the good guys in their mind and some of the ones you think yeah he's a bit he's a bit dodgy isn't he? you know so he's a bit of an <laughs> asshole yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> but also there's probably some people who would say that about me so maybe you won't go too far it. <laughs> yeah i know if i when i share this on linkedin i bet there'd be a hell of a hell of a lot of people saying about me because I've, I've seen a lot of wealth in the last 20 years so i'm sure there will be a lot of people saying <laughs> saying a few choice well, words yeah look that was probably one of the main things i was worried about was originally posting it and thinking just originally getting it out there and 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 you know, it's, it was quite nerve wracking, but now I've, I've done a few, so it isn't so bad at the moment. I think it's brilliant. Like I said, like I said, right at the top of this, this pod, I think it's amazing to, to have a podcast like this out because there is nothing really out there like it. Um, and the bravery for yourself, Christian, to, to put yourself out there, because it's very hard for everyone to say, what a fucking load of rubbish. Why would anyone want to listen to that? Well, don't then just don't listen to it. But for everyone, a bad thing, you might get three or four people saying that's brilliant you know that this could encourage the next generation of welder to come through this could be something that people actually want to listen to and you never know it might inspire the old person to think i reckon i could give this a go you know i might i might push myself on to be a welder to an inspector supervisor or whatever it might do because let's face it it's an industry where you can you can earn a, a decent living out of it you know in and you haven't got to be a welder you know we in, we employ an IT person, someone in marketing, you know, testing coordinators that literally follow test pieces around. You know, our, our operations team, we prepare all the welder qualifications, procedures. None of these people are welders. So the welding industry has got so many different elbows and arms and, and legs to it that you can you can investigate. Radiographer, we've got site techs, we've got so many people at Coda Weld. Not one of them is a welder anymore. We don't weld. We haven't welded since 2005. So the welding industry can give you a hell of a lot and a good life and you haven't got to be a welder as such you know so there's so many routes you can investigate within the industry and, and yeah and it can give you a, a decent life and you meet some cracking people along the way as well yeah definitely 100 percent um what would you say the welding industry needs then currently what do you think we can do better um i think it needs some investment at, at at sort of youth school either level probably even a little bit before that you know when i was at school unless you were going to be a doctor or a vet or a teacher or, or an academic you were kind of cast aside you know I'm, I'm going back to the the early mid 90s and things like that but and i know it's changed a lot since now since then sorry i know they they put more of an emphasis on different types of learning but unless you're an academic you had no chance but i'd like to see metal work come back into schools I don't know whether it is coming back in as, as much as it should do, but 
metal work coming back into schools, more apprenticeships, more government funding for apprenticeships to get people in, companies trusting younger people to do it. Um, because it starts from there. Because the generation of welders is, is plus 55, the average age of a welder. And those that are welding can't wait to get into inspection. We need welders coming through. And those welders will then go on to be inspectors and potentially not move up because it's not better being an inspector than it is a welder. Moving sideways in the industries into, into different things. So we've got to keep it coming through. So things like skill weld and, and world skill and, and sponsorship and, and social media about welding, you know, people are on Instagram and stuff like that, showing off welding skills. All this stuff's got to be promoted because we need the next generation of welder to come through because we've got a hell of a lot going on in the UK in the next 20, 30 years. And all we'll be doing is shipping in welders from, from elsewhere and we won't actually be, be doing it ourselves. And it's, it's good opportunities for young people to get into it. So yeah, a lot of investment at a younger level, I'd say, you know. Yeah, sort of Instagram and, and these things is such completely new to me. I've, I've recently started an Instagram for the podcast and it's never really been anything I've been involved in, um, yeah. you know, welding wise. Probably because my welds never looked good enough to be put on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... but you see some of the, like, there's, there's, there's well, well porn in there and you look at some of the welds and, I mean, if you're sad like me, you could look at them all day and get really excited about how good they look. But that, that sort of thing's amazing because some of the welding can be beautiful, you know? Some of the TIG work you're looking at, there's some titanium stuff. And one of the guys I used to work with, Simon, Simon's got a weld art company and he does these amazing sort of waves. There's this wave he's done, he's doing all this sort of, that sort of stuff just it's got to inspire people to to get involved a little bit more you know so yeah i think that that's kind of something that it's, it's tough for us as a company as code well we can't really do that because at the end of the day we're a certification company you know we're, we're certifying ndt procedures qualifications so our instagram page or our TikTok page would be very boring you know another world of qual tested or here's a tent cell being pulled or here's a ferrite count you know to me and you we'd love it but i don't yeah. think that's going to invite anyone into the industry they probably think look at these sad gits looking at lumps of metal but you know sexy welding that's that's great you know get it out there and, and showcase it and hopefully attract people in to, to want to do it and there are some great colleges out there as well now there is some really good stuff we Grimsby College are massive in what they're doing. Riverside College at Witness, they're brilliant. Bridgewater College, just local to me. There's some really good colleges that are really trying to, to get involved. And, and we work with a lot of them with Skill World. And it's good, but there could be more. You know, there should be a lot more. Yeah, well, obviously, I've I've kind of reached out to a, to a few people, but you know, if there's anybody you can think of who would like to come on and, and have a chat and, and discuss the industry, then feel free to you know to give them my details and tell them to reach out because I would like to speak to as many people as possible. Really, definitely, yeah, definitely. And I think I think it's really important from this from your platform, not telling you how to do your job. I always do this to whoever I speak to as well, and just get a massive range of people. You know, get welders, get radiographers, get college lecturers get get a, a bloody a, a, someone from lincoln electric who sells welding plant to come on because it's all part of our industry and it all forms the same sort of thing and if everyone starts saying the same thing about investing in in the next generation and things like that and the problems they've seen with it but ultimately they'll end up talking positively about what is a good industry you know it's, it's fantastic for the pod and you've got so many different variations coming on on it it's brilliant yeah it'd be it'd be a really diverse podcast and it'd be a great listen as well definitely yeah yeah that's definitely the plan i've i've have quite a few varied guests as you said from different parts of the industry you know slightly all and everyone has their own story which is good because yeah. welding can can be different for everyone you know whether you're welding gates or whether you're welding high pressure steam lines definitely. you know it's different it would mean something to everybody so yeah and everyone's got their own story aren't they of how they came yeah. into it weird and wonderful ways i don't think any well, some some may you know but i don't think there's many sort of five or six year olds that say what do you want to be when you grow up i want to be a welder there's not many saying that but we all end up in an industry and we all kind of kind of enjoy it in a, in a weird and sort of wonderful way um so yeah it's uh It'd be good to get just get a massive different broad brush of people on there to, just to see how they all got into it because it's so interesting to hear about other people and how did you get into welding you know and, and how did it become and it's not always that me dad or my uncle was a welder so i was going to do it very often it is but there is some weird and wonderful stories and the people you meet along the way they're like i don't really know how i ended up here 
I don't really know. I ended up doing this shutdown on this this nuclear nuclear blooming cooling pond up at Sellafield, but I'm up here, and you know it's it's, yeah. it's brilliant. Okay, so probably wrapping up about about now. So, is there anything that you any piece of advice you'd give somebody new to the game or somebody looking to come into the industry? Um, any advice? Um, no matter what you're doing, I'd always just say keep your standards high. Never ever have a day off on that. Never ever let your let your standards drop, and that's in terms of your integrity of what you're doing, um, how hard you work with it. You know when you're committed to something, if you can work your nuts off and do it to the best of your ability with a high integrity, you'll always get a job. You'll be massively employable. The people you work with will respect you, um, and that's kind of all you can give. The knowledge you can learn that. You can go on courses, you can be trained it, but integrity, honesty, hard work, trying to do it with a bit of a smile on your face and have a crack at the same time, these are the things you can't be taught. So it would be that really, you know, real basic. I mean, that's the secret, isn't it? Like if you can work hard, do it with a smile on your face, try and enjoy it to the best of your own ability, you can't ever do any more than that. So it's a real simple thing, but yeah, just just work your nuts off and, and just be true to your word as well. You know, as, as a man or as, as a woman, the only thing you've really got you can, is your word. If you give your word about doing something, just follow through with it. You know, be true to yourself and be true to your word. And, and I think you'll do all right, no, no matter where you go, really. I think that's, that's about as, as good of advice as I could probably think of on the spot like that. You put me on the spot there, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but obviously, thank you very much for taking the time. Obviously, you know, very busy man, lots of things going on. But, you know, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. And um Obviously, the podcast will be out. I'm not sure how many weeks. I have a couple pre-recorded, yeah. but obviously, I'll let you know. Um, and thank you very much for Super. taking the time. Christian, thanks for the invitation. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've really, really enjoyed it. And I, I wish you and the podcast, whichever direction it goes in, I wish you all the best for the future. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Adam. Cheers, thanks mate. Cheers, buddy. Bye.